Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andrew Shapiro. Uh, I'm the town's director of community and economic development. Just want to acknowledge a few people in the room. Uh, I have my colleagues, uh, Gene Henway, who's the planning director, as well as Zach Melcher, who's our new uh, staff planner in the planning department um, here with me tonight. Uh, we have our uh, consulting team from the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission, Ian Burns and Kayla Rennie. I'll let them introduce themselves and give you their titles in a few minutes when they start their uh, presentation. Um, but I just wanted to also take a minute to acknowledge some other folks in the room. So we've got some select board members. I see our chair, Janice Phillips. We have Laura Bates. We have Brian Roach. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, Peter Boynton is on our planning board. Thank you, Peter, for being here. Um, and we have our uh, Housing Authority Executive Director Maggie Cleary. I just wanted to acknowledge those folks and uh, thank you to everybody uh, for making the time this evening to come out and learn about um, this new state program or mandate, really. Uh, so just a quick broad overview, and the, a lot of this material is going to get covered in the um, presentation itself. Uh, but we're here this evening to learn about the uh, changes to the State Zoning Act. Um, and we've already had a couple conversations with uh, the planning board and the select board about this. Um, the state is requiring many or most um, communities in greater eastern Massachusetts uh, that are designated as MBTA communities, essentially communities that have service through the MBTA. Um, and in our case, we're considered an MBTA adjacent community because obviously we have Haverhill, Andover, and Lawrence uh, directly next to us that are all served by those uh, services. And in those communities, the state is asking us to designate certain areas um, as um, being zoned for, as of right, multifamily housing. And the reason they're doing that, and, and our colleagues from MVPC will go into more detail on that, is because um, we, have a, we have what we consider to be a housing crisis on our hands right now with respect to people being able to find um, reasonable, affordable accommodations to live in a lot of the communities um, uh, around eastern Massachusetts. So, We've already um, had a lot of conversations internally and again with the planning board and select board about um, options and how we're going to comply with this mandated um, state law. And uh, I want to allow uh, Ian and the team from MPPC to jump right into a presentation and go into a little more detail on it. We'll obviously invite questions and discussions. And um, we hope you guys learn a lot tonight. So uh, without further ado, here's Ian Burns from the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. Thank you, Andrew. Hi everyone, thank you again for joining us tonight. Like Andrew said, Ian Burns here. I oversee our community and economic development team at the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission and I'll tell you a little bit about us in a second. I'm joined by Kayla Rennie who is also on our community and economic development team at MVPC. Um, and so tonight, as Andrew said, we're gonna talk about MBTA communities in North Andover. What is the law? What is it requiring? And what is the approach that we're looking at right now in town? And you know, what feedback you all have and questions you have. So just so you can get a sense of where we're going tonight, we'll start with just introductions to what we're doing here. Um, we're going to take a quick look at North Andover's housing conditions. So to give you a sense of uh, exactly what are we dealing with in North Andover, Andrew mentioned from a state lens, they're looking at what they consider a housing crisis. And so how is that reflected here in town and what are our um, uh, current conditions here in North Andover? Then we're going to look at an overview of the law and its actual regulations. So you can get an idea of what the state is requiring of us. Uh, we'll pause for questions. I will say feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just want to let you know that we will have moments throughout that we'll pause and, and, and hear feedback and questions from you all. After that, we're going to dive into what exactly we're looking at in North Andover right now. And as we've been working with the town and the planning board and the select board and selecting some potential sites for districts, um, what have we come around to and show you kind of our thinking and our thought process around it but then get some feedback from all of you about what you think about what we're, what we're putting forward um, in combination with the town and the select board and planning board. And after that, we'll pause again for some more questions and discussions about the districts themselves. So just so you all know why we are here, as Andrew mentioned, uh, as the consulting team, um, we are in this sense uh, wearing a consultant hat. However, we're, we're a quasi-state agency, the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. We are your regional planning agency. The entire state is divided into about a dozen regional planning agencies. We cover the territory from Lawrence all the way to the coast in Newburyport. There's about 15 cities and towns we oversee. And so in that region, we're assisting North Andover as well as about seven other communities implementing this law. So we're seeing what's happening across the region. In addition to community and economic development, we also help with transportation planning, environmental planning, and a host of other areas. 
So our goal here is to help you find possible paths to compliance. It's not to come in here and tell you um, that you have to comply and wear the state hat and tell you why you need to be doing it. It's to show you what your options are because at the end of the day, town meeting voters have the final say in what's gonna happen here. As I mentioned, we have two of our staff members here and we also have a third in our department um, that's helping out with this work. So with that in mind, like I said, we're gonna take a quick look at some of North Andover's data so you can get some context for how we are approaching the housing situation. Before we look at housing specifically, uh, we just wanted to show what we think is a pretty telling chart of North Andover's age uh, distribution projections. And so if you watched any of the planning board or select board meeting, uh, you didn't get to see this. So congratulations, you get a little bit more of insight here. So with the age distribution projections, what we're looking at here is the different age cohorts from 2010 to projection in 2050 and how the population in North Andover is going to be changing over that time. The biggest thing to notice, as you may have picked out already, the 65 plus age cohort, that light blue line from 2010 to 2050 is roughly doubling. And so from now until then, you're going to see about a 12% increase in the 65 plus age cohort, while at the same time you see every other age cohort either plateauing or decreasing. And so when we think about North Andover's housing needs, this is something that we really like to consider as we think, what does it mean to have an aging population? What kind of housing needs does that aging population have? And how can we anticipate those needs so that by 2050, when we see those projected age cohorts, age cohorts we're prepared for those folks in town. So now let's take a look at the housing conditions. And so this is a chart that we show uh, across the region. I'll mention uh, the last one I showed, we see that reflected in a lot of cities and towns with aging populations. This chart we see similarly across uh, other cities and towns in the Merrimack Valley as well. And so the big takeaway here, we're talking about cost burden. Can people afford to live where they are living in town as a renter, owner, or overall? Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, federal government defines cost burden as someone that spends more than 30% of their income on housing and severely cost burden if you're spending more than 50% of your income on housing. And this is your gross income. This is your pre-tax income, 30% of that, how much of it is going towards housing. As you can see, half of all renters in North Andover are cost burdened. So half of folks renting really cannot afford the rent that they are paying. One in three households of all types across North Andover are cost burdened. And then even one in four homeowners are cost burdened here in town. So we think about why are they cost burdened? What does that mean? And also what are the local economic impacts of that? When you have folks that are struggling to pay rent, that means they're not going and spending money downtown at restaurants and shops and other places. So how can we make sure that they have more money in their pocket, not only for their standard of living, but so that we can be you know, contributing to the economic multiplier here in town. The next thing that we think is really uh, telling and we look at this across other cities and towns is the actual household occupancy versus the actual unit makeup. So this is looking at uh, how many people are living in a housing unit versus what is the size of that housing unit. So that lets us see where the gaps are and where the need may be. So in North Andover, for example, as you can see, the, house, the chart on the left break down by occupancy. On the right are the actual sizes of the units. One or two person households in North Andover make up 54% of homes, while one or two bedroom homes make up only 38% of the housing stock. So you're seeing there uh, you know, a double digit mismatch in terms of the size of the household versus the actual units that are available to them. Then when you look at three or more person households, you see they make up 45% of North Andover homes but three or more bedroom housing units make up 61% of North Andover's housing stock. Now we certainly expect to see a mismatch there because you will have empty nesters and other folks that are choosing to stay in their homes. Maybe their kids have left and they want to stay in their four bedroom home. That's totally fine and we want them to have that option. When we see this, what we do know is that for the folks that are empty nesters or are just two people living in a three or four bedroom home, they're probably not going to have the option to downsize because of that mismatch where you have a lot of people competing for few one and two bedroom units. So that speaks a little bit to what the need might be here in town. Um, across the Merrimack Valley, we see this mismatch in a lot of communities. Some communities, it's much, much larger of a mismatch. Some, it's much closer. So this is good context. And this, these charts were updated uh, with recent permit data from uh, new apartments built in town just within the past few years. And then the final chart that we wanted to show you all today before we dive into things is the percent change in rent, home value, and income in North Andover over the last 20 years. 
So from 2000 to 2020, household incomes went up about 57%. Rent went up 105% in those 20 years. So you see rent is doubling the pace of income. So that speaks to why we see half of our renters not being able to afford their rent and being considered cost burden. Home values are also outpacing household income, albeit at a smaller rate. Across the region, we see this bar a little bit higher as compared to household income. One of the things we think that's happening here in North Andover is it's really a product of you're seeing uh, the family incomes be more wealthy simply because the wealthy folks are the ones that are able to buy the homes in North Andover today. So that's why that is a little bit closer in bars. But I think it's really telling when we talk about housing crisis, we talk about the lack of supply and, and the large demand, and that results in that gross rent being 105% increasing over 20 years versus household income. So those are the, the things that we consider when we talk about housing. And across the state, the numbers are a little bit different. They're similar, but this is what the state was considering when uh, the legislature dug in and decided to pass the MBTA communities law. And so now let's talk a little bit about what the regulations are and what they mean here in town. So MBTA communities, the statute, like I mentioned, the legislature passed this law back in 2021. The goal was to address the housing crisis. The law at its crux, as Andrew mentioned, is requiring cities and towns near an MBTA service station to zone for multifamily housing as of right. It is only to create a zoning district. This is not a production mandate. It is just to create a zoning district. So when you hear us talk about throughout the presentation today, number of units, density of units, whatever that conversation is, I want you to think in your mind that we're only talking about zoning here. So when we say we need to create an X number of units, we're looking at an area and saying, if there were no housing units here, theoretically under the zoning, what could be constructed? So we're only talking about zoning in this, uh, this law. So I already mentioned a couple of these things. The legislation itself requires uh, multifamily housing permitted as of right. There can be no age restrictions or restrictions on the size of units. So you can't say you can only build studio apartments and you also can't say it's only for people under the age of 50. Um, minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in a minute. And where applicable has to be within a half mile of a commuter rail station. That doesn't apply to North Andover as you are considered an adjacent community. So it really can be located in many areas across town with the thought process is what we'll show in a minute. The state has some suggestions for where to zone, what is the best area that might, be, uh, might make sense for communities for this type of zoning. So that's what the statute says. And the state had to put out regulations in order to uh, comply with the statute and tell cities and towns what they need to do. So it split up uh, all cities and towns across Eastern Massachusetts into three categories, really four categories, but we're only going to talk about three today because those are the only ones in our region. So commuter rail communities are communities with a commuter rail stop. Adjacent communities, that's North Andover. Those are communities bordering a town or a city with a commuter rail stop. And then adjacent small town, those are cities and towns <coughs> with a significantly lower amount of housing units that do not, are not home to a commuter rail stop and they have uh, a little bit of different regulations to follow. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about adjacent communities because that's what North Andover is. But this map uh, may be helpful to give you some context for seeing you know, where North Andover's neighbors are at and exactly what, uh, who is needing to comply with this statute. So adjacent communities themselves, uh, as I mentioned, this is North Andover. So we have to find a zoning district that is a minimum, minimum of 50 acres or 1.5% of the developable land in the town. In North Andover's case, we're going with 50 acres. The zoning has to allow for a minimum of 15 units per acre. The district has to have a capacity for multifamily units equal to 10% of the entire housing stock. So they look at how many units across town are, that are there, they take 10% of that, and that's the minimum required to zone for. And then we have to have reasonable access to a transit station. Um, this is really saying that if you can, you should make it so that where people are living, they can maybe take a bus to the transit station or they are near a highway that they can get there easily. How can we make it reasonable for them? And then I showed you the, the map earlier. This is a breakdown of some numbers. So you can see where North Andover sits compared to the rest of the Merrimack Valley. This is all of MVPC's region. So that's what we pull up here. North Andover uh, is required to zone for a capacity of 1,100, roughly 1,200 units. Um, as you can see across the region, that's right about in the middle. Um, helpful to point out, for example, Andover, which has a commuter rail stop, has to zone for almost double that. They have over 2,000 units that they're required to zone for. 
Uh, the smaller towns, as you can see, go as low as West Newberry at 87, but then Haverhill and Lawrence over there, over 4,000 units each that they're required to zone for. So North Andover is sitting about in the middle here in terms of the zoning capacity we have to see in the district as we play it out. So a bit about the timeline. Uh, North Andover has to be in compliance with the state by December 31st, 2024 as an adjacent community. Over the past two years, well, one to two years, the town has been taking steps in order to remain in what they call interim compliance. So they had to submit um, an interim plan to the state to show that they're taking steps. However, what we're really at now is the meat of the process where we are looking to find districts, getting feedback from residents, drafting a bylaw, and then going and having public hearings about that bylaw. So the step we're at here today is to get some feedback from you all, help you all to understand, but then also hear what you all think you need to see in town. As you can see, because our deadline is December 31st, the target is to propose a bylaw for the May 2024 annual town meeting. So just a quick note on why we need to comply. There's been a lot of discussion about what exactly is the penalty if we don't comply. So certainly it may come to North Andover or other communities. We may see that town meeting doesn't approve the zoning bylaw that is proposed. So these are some of the penalties the state has said they will enforce on communities that do not approve a bylaw that is compliant. Number one, the town will lose access to over a dozen state grant programs. Here in North Andover, uh, the town has accessed about over uh, $5 million in funding from these programs over the last several years. Um, there are several other programs on there that the town is eligible for that may need funding from in the future. It's also worth mentioning that the state has made clear that um, if you are not compliant, they may use that non-compliance in their determination of other state grant programs that may have anything to do with touching housing. And a lot of things touch housing in the state. So when cities and towns go to apply for grants, even right now, they have to check a box that says, are you in interim compliance or are you not in interim compliance? And if they don't check that box, they lose a significant amount of points on that grant application, makes you less likely in order to get makes you less likely to get money to do the projects that a lot of folks are looking for. Also, the state attorney general released guidance stating that in the attorney general's opinion, this law is not optional. So on top of losing, potentially losing access to those grant programs, cities and towns may face civil litigation for not complying. The state has not taken action yet against cities and towns. However, we have seen um, nonprofit uh, civil rights groups suing a few communities across the state that have not been compliant and bringing them to court to force them into compliance. We'll see how that plays out. I'm gonna stop right there because I gave a lot of information about the regulations themselves and what the state is looking for. Um, does anybody have any questions and want any clarifying uh, comments on what the state is requiring of us and, and why we're here today? Yeah. So it's one parcel of 50 acres that's currently undeveloped. So it does not need to be undeveloped, it can be developed, and it can be multiple parcels. So we're looking at creating an overlay zoning district that could cover, if you had one parcel that was 50 acres, it would work, or it could be 10 parcels that are five acres each. Um, you can also, as you'll see, one of the things we're talking about, uh, split it up into sub-districts. So you could have a group of parcels in one area of town and a group of parcels in another area of town. Um, when I said, I was speaking to undeveloped, when we're considering could we house 1,200 units under the zoning, Really what we're saying is, if let's say we zoned it um, in downtown, if there were no buildings downtown and a project came in today, under the zoning could they theoretically put up those units? But you can zone it anywhere even if there's development there right now. And one, one, parcel, yeah. one parcel has to be at least 25 acres, right? One, district, one sub district must be at least five acres um, contiguous and then 25 acres near um, in the area in town that we're looking at down near Market Pass, yeah. I saw a couple, I saw your hand, yeah. You already have identified some areas that you're looking at? Yeah, so we'll look at it in a second. We have some potential areas, and so that's why we're here today to hear what you think of those. We talked with the planning board and select board about them. We got some feedback. We've run through many uh, options and come to a couple we think could work, but we're trying to see what, what you all think, and we'll look at those in the next section, yeah. Can you get a copy of these slides? Definitely, I'm sure the town can post it on their website so you can access it. Okay. Yeah. Transportation, how does that factor into the districting? Does there have to be public transportation access to the districts? It, it's not required, but it is encouraged. Yeah. It, I, 
just had a question on your slide showing the uh, cost burden of residents. How mm -hmm. does that compare with the region and the state? Do, do you have that data? Um, I don't know the state off the top of my head, but in terms of the region, we see about half of renters across the region are also cost burdened. So North Andover is right about average for cities and towns. Similarly with ownership data. Um, in some communities, it's more extreme uh, than that. Yeah. Moving forward, it would be helpful, I think, for the community to be able to see what the grant programs are that we would have in jeopardy yeah. and how much we've received from each of those grants. Certainly. We have a full list of them. Um, I actually took that slide out of this presentation to make it shorter, but we, we have that available for you. Yeah. Under this program, how is the town of Oxford characterized? Um, they are a rural uh, and small town adjacent community. Um, so they have a lower threshold for units to zone for. We're, we're working with the town of Boxford as well. They're one of the communities where the consultants for in addition to North Andover. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Those are great questions. And feel free, don't be shy to ask more about what we just went over when we get into the next section of the presentation. Um, <clears throat> Want to make sure that everyone has a full understanding and that we can uh, answer and address any concerns. So as we were just mentioning and we kind of just hinted at, these are the factors that the state has recommended we consider when looking at potential district locations and things that we also consider as we're chatting and looking at areas and talking with the planning board and select board and others about what may make sense. So some of those is acreage. So we want to see what kind of developable land. When we say developable, we're not necessarily saying is it an open field, but is it a big wetland or is it a site that you could potentially build housing on. Like if there's a structure there, we consider it developable because there is development there. Location proximate to transit access. So again, is it feasible to get to transit? Is there a stop nearby, maybe a bus stop or something of the, the like? Walkability pedestrian access. If there is not walkability there right now, is it an area where we can envision there being some type of mixed use where there's commercial in addition to housing? If it's an area that already has commercial, would there be, would more housing lend itself to being walkable so that we're not adding to car trips and adding to traffic in the community. And access to commercial centers. Similar uh, in that vein, are folks able to get to their shops, their supermarkets, their restaurants pretty easily? We don't want to be putting this somewhere where they have to drive 20 minutes across town maybe to get somewhere or 20 minutes across town to get to a, a highway ramp to get into Boston because we think it makes the most sense to minimize traffic, let's say going through the old center, for example, so that we don't see the, the, those kinds of uh, buildups across town. So modeling for compliance, what exactly are we doing when, we're, when I say we're meeting and kind of looking at things uh, behind the scenes here? So as we look at potential zoning districts, the state has provided us with what they're calling a compliance model. What that is is essentially a giant Excel spreadsheet and we take the parcels we're considering, we plug them into that spreadsheet and then we plug in potential zoning restrictions like minimum lot size, building height, setbacks, parking ratios, and that spreadsheet helps do some math to say if you have a 10 acre parcel and you have 20 foot setbacks and you require two spaces per housing unit, how much is able to be constructed on that lot? And it spits out our number for saying, here's how much we could potentially build given your restrictions and given the parcel you've put into the spreadsheet. So as we're working through districts, we're downloading data on the parcels, we're putting them in the spreadsheet, we're running some numbers for it, for us to, for it to tell us if we're reaching that roughly 1,200 unit capacity, and if we're reaching that density required. So when I talk about these districts and we show you some things we're thinking, that's where we're getting these numbers from to see if it's uh, potentially in compliance. And at the end of the day, for the town to be in compliance, it will have to submit these numbers to the state to show that the math checks out. Before we look at the district itself, we wanted to give you a few examples of when we say 15 units per acre, what could that be? And so a lot of times when we talk about apartment buildings, we picture large scale development, um, which is certainly a, an option. We wanted to show you what also qualifies as 15 units per acre across town right now. So for example, we have two <coughs> multifamily structures, one on Main Street, one on Marblehead Street, both um, around the corner here. Um, those model out to be over 30 units an acre simply because the structure itself is taking up a lot of the maybe quarter acre parcel. So when you stick 10 units on, let's say a quarter acre parcel, it models to be a high density. So we're not saying literally 15 units are on that parcel, but that the density of it, the units on the acreage is averaging out to 15 units per acre. So if you zone for this, let's say over a lot of small parcels, then a developer, if they were building 15 units per acre, 
this would be on the high end of 15 years per acre. You say that's more than double what it actually could be. So density doesn't always need to be high rise buildings. Density can be what we would call gentle density where it's a little bit more in tune um, with what folks are seeing in like the downtown area, for example. Two more uh, slides on that just to give you, then you have a medium scale development example. So Sutton Street right down the street here, that models out to 29 units an acre. And then a recent uh, proposal down on Main Street, uh, 38 units per acre at the old um, Santander Bank, I believe, um, on Main Street. And so those are more medium scale. You see, again, those are almost double, more than double the density required simply because of the amount of units on the parcel size. And then, of course, you have larger scale developments that also qualify for 15 units per acre. So Princeton Properties up at Route 125 models out to 21 units per acre. And Avalon Bay over in the Mill District is modeling out to 18 units per acre. And so again, even these large scale developments are above what is required, are more dense than what is required under the state regulations. So with all of that in mind, as we've been looking through the potential sites around town and hearing feedback from the planning board, select board, and also thinking about feedback that we've heard from residents in the past about housing development, what might make sense for these zoning districts? So there are two that we want to show you here today and talk about and get your feedback on. Like I said, we want to hear your thoughts um, about this in general and around town and what makes sense here. And so the two we're going to look at, one is the Market Basket Plaza, that's 350 Winthrop Street, the North Andover Mall. And the other is 1600 Osgood Street, Osgood Landing, um, currently Amazon, formerly Lucent. And we'll look at that property as well. So with these two uh, districts, these sub-districts combined, we would be in compliance as a town if we were to take these today and put on some dimensional requirements and submit it to the state, we know it would be compliant. So these are some examples of how we can get there to kind of get your mind thinking about, you know, does this make sense and what we're proposing and, and, and could it be an option for town? So first, Market Basket Plaza, that uh, pink stripe overlay is the actual, uh, it's really four parcels there, two really large ones and then two smaller ones. So the Market Basket Plaza itself, the reason we looked at it, number one, it's currently served by a couple MEVA bus routes. Uh, formerly MVRTA, so easy access to a lot of other areas via public transportation. It's close uh, on 114 to several other businesses. Um, it's a gateway improvement opportunity. That was something mentioned in the, some of the master plan strategies from the town to improve the gateways to the community. Um, and then also it's easy access to Route 495 there for folks needing to get in and out of town right off of the area. The other thing, you know, as we look at some of these parcels is we consider what is the development opportunity there? Is there potential for development? Yes, of course, there's space there. Do we know that that is going to become apartments tomorrow? Probably not. But thinking about long term, what could potentially be happening at some of these sites? So when we look at um, some options, again, these are just options we're looking at right now. Some things you could consider for the dimensional uh, criteria and the standards in the zoning code itself. You could look at a max building height of four stories. Lot coverage of 35%, require 30% open space, and then keep minimum parking spaces per unit at about one and three quarters across the development. So if we put in those zoning parameters, um, we come out to about 18 units per acre for density. So that's a slightly above what we need, gets us in the realm of what we're looking for, checks that box. Um, and then this, I'll show you a minute, combined with Osgood Landing, gets you also to that minimum unit capacity. In addition to these, we also put a limit on density um, in the actual bylaw that we're considering. So it, you would not see density higher than 18 units per acre by right in this district. And then Osgood Landing, many of you are familiar with this property as well. And so this actually comes from uh, uh, the 40R district that was approved in there by town meeting several years ago. And so right now there is some multifamily housing allowed there. So it's grabbing that multifamily housing that's currently allowed and using it for this zoning here. A couple of things that look as potential options for this. Number one, um, like we said, it's also near uh, 125 and it's near uh, some highway exits if you go a little bit farther up to Ward Hill. There is potential for MEVA bus route expansion there. Uh, Amazon and other folks have been talking with MEVA and there's also just general interest in MEVA for expanding along 125 from the Lawrence Commuter Rail Station up to Haverhill. So with stops there would give us some transit access and the town also has funds to do a feasibility study of a commuter rail stop at this site. And so there is potential for, in the future, a commuter rail stop um, if the MBTA was interested in that. In addition to that, aligns with some master plan strategies. Again, 
It's an entrance to the town and a gateway to the town coming from Haverhill, so potential redevelopment there um, could add some uh, uh, better sight lines coming into the community. So pretty uh, similar dimensional criteria here um, as, uh, um, compared to the market basket dimensional criteria. So looking at, again, max building height of four stories, max parking space is 1.75 per unit and requiring 30% open space on the site. Um, when you plug all those numbers in, we get just above our 15 units per acre required, get to 15.4 units per acre in the density itself. And so when we model all of that out, this is a screenshot actually from that Excel spreadsheet I was referencing. Over here, this is the guideline requirements. So required to zone for about 1,200 units, required to zone for this density, and required to have this uh, land area. We model out to just above what we need, so that's good. We got 1,300 there um, in terms of the unit capacity. We get 16.2 dwelling units per acre, so just above what's required, so that's good there. Check. And then we are also above the minimum land area required. So you see that's a, a large mismatch in terms of uh, requiring 50 acres and we're at 91 acres. The reason for that is we wanted to spread out the um, actual unit capacity as much as possible across town so that those 1,300 units aren't only at one site um, in the community. If we were to put them all somewhere else, you'd see that density go way up above 16. Um, units per acre and we wanted to keep the density as close to 15 as possible and that requires us to look at more land area. I'm going to stop there on those districts. I don't know if the town staff has anything to add on the districts themselves, but I'd love to hear thoughts, questions, feedback, other um, comments about these districts we're looking at right now. Like I said, we actually had um, some other options we talked with the planning board and select board about. We went to them and showed some, some, some areas. The planning board had several discussions about some areas, and this is what it was narrowed down to at this time. And so that's why we're coming to you all for, for feedback on those two sections right now. Yeah, hand back there. Have you considered the impact on the traffic that has between the Avalon, this apartment community, Amazon, and now you're putting, these roads are just horrible yeah. now yeah. to drive. And if you put this in, are you planning on handling traffic? What are you planning for that? Yeah, so, so two things on that. Number one, um, one of the reasons we chose these districts is for them to be closer to highways, like I said, so that we wouldn't see a lot of traffic build up across the town. Um, number two, knowing that this is only a zoning requirement and not a building requirement at this time, we also wanted to zone in areas that we know it, it may not happen tomorrow. There's potential for development, of course, in all of these sites. We're not going to say nothing's going to happen, but thinking about um, where would these make the most sense if a development goes in to minimize traffic to get access to highways, and then also where would it make the most sense given the sites that we have across town. Um, really, when we looked at it and said, you know, would this make sense downtown? Are there other areas that would make sense? We saw more traffic concerns in these two sites, but certainly open, you know, if, if in folks' opinion, if in your opinions there are other sites across town that would have less of an impact on traffic, would love to have that conversation. I saw a hand, I think. I, I just, if my math is right, at the current 40 yard Osgood Landing is 20 units per acre for 58 acres as zoned as of right today. So does that not mean that we're already in compliance or is there another factor that's not? I'll let uh, your town planner take that question. So the 40R does allow for up to 20 units per acre in certain sub-districts within that 40R, so not all the sub-districts. And remember that 40R has been condensed because of the Amazon development, so it's decreased from 168 acres down to approximately 60 acres. And then um, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the 40R district splits some of those parcels that we were looking at. Um, and in terms of the state looking at compliance, um, it's much easier for us to reach compliance if we don't split parcels in half. Um, there are a bit more complicating factors and more um, clarifying questions we have to go through with the state if we start cutting parcels apart. And then also that 40 yard density is higher than what we were looking at, so this brought it down to 15, closer to that 15 units per acre than 20. Um, just because we do the zoning doesn't mean that we're not going to do the traffic studies right. and the mitigation right. and everything that we would generally do. That, that's a very good point. So with, when a development comes in, we still have site plan review here. 
And so when site plan review happens, that's when the planning board would look through all of those other conditions and say, are you mitigating these other factors we're anticipating? And in addition, it's helpful to think when we go through most zoning changes, we, we don't always go through many, many studies for what development could possibly happen given the zoning change. We want to consider the impact it could have on the town, certainly, but a bit of a different approach when we're talking zoning versus building, knowing we have site plan review when this actually happens if construction or a application comes through. I think it's also important um, with respect to traffic to point out that on both in both of these districts they front state roadways. So there, you know, in all likelihood, uh, there are many iterations of different types of developments that would be proposed that would require a state permit from um, Mass DOT, um, which usually leads to an extra layer of review and potentially some additional mitigation that might be required by uh, required from the state. Um, which was the case, for instance, for Amazon. Amazon had to do some work to um, improve the site circulation and the entrance and exits to their site because of the state um, permit. I, I think that was also the case with Princeton Properties, if I'm not mistaken, as well. So typically when, you know, again, that's another advantage, in my view at least, to looking at these particular sites that are along state highways because it's an extra level of review given by the state in terms of uh, transportation mitigation. Yeah, very cool. Traffic mitigation. Yeah. And I guess let's make go back to an earlier question. Yeah. If, if we were to zone a district that has existing housing, mm -hmm. the number of units you zone for is not in addition to the existing housing. Right. That is, is kind of how much existing housing is in either of these two districts? I believe it's zero, correct? Right. There's no housing on those sites, but it, it doesn't matter whether you zone over housing or not in terms of the, the zoning capacity. Yeah. You're right. It wouldn't change if we put it on what an apartment complex is. We wouldn't subtract the units that are in that apartment complex from our total we're trying to get to. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, or feedback? Can you yeah. go back to the, to the two maps, maybe the market basket one first? Yeah. Yep. Market basket. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind with this uh, market basket plaza as well, down here is a lot of wetland. And so this zoning act also does not supersede any environmental concerns and all of the state and local environmental laws are still in effect so they wouldn't be able to um, flout any wetlands concerns in that area so some of that would not see development at all so i understand that this is just about creating a zone mm -hmm. and not necessarily building anything but we can't build anything there mm -hmm. what can you show me the next one yeah. It, any um, any perspective on concerns in that district for building something? If, if that came to it, is there a reason why? Well, I and then I'm I'm looking at this. I'm not entirely sure we can build anything here right now either. Is it and why is that? Like in terms of the capacity of the site, the well, conditions, I, what are we? So I, I'm not quite sure. I'm not nearly as familiar with this as I am with market basket. Mm -hmm. But does this have the new Amazon property on it? Nope. So Amazon is located back here. Okay, so we're only talking about the part that's in the tank. Correct. Okay. And so you don't need to have the ability to build something on the site tomorrow. And so like Market Basket, for example, just because Market Basket is there doesn't make the site ineligible. It's saying if tomorrow we snapped a finger, Market Basket didn't exist, could we build, could the units be built under the zoning? Well, I guess, you know, we, we say that they're not compelling us to build anything yet. Mm -hmm. This doesn't really help us if, if they decide to pull that trigger, right? We can't use the market basket property. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, I wouldn't anticipate the state to do land grabbings anytime soon. And they say, now you zoned a market basket, we're going to take market basket. But um, no, no, no. they would take it. But I mean, you said yourself, this is just about zoning. Mm -hmm. They are not compelling us to build anything yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I sort of feel like it's a false start. I mean, yeah, I'd love to get some, uh, some thoughts. Too. I don't know if other people have I ideas, but getting back to that, our, uh, in, our inability to build something, is it more of like the capacity in town? What's, what's the concern about, I want to know concerns about building something on that site so we can help and figure out what that is. And, and, and maybe if other sites make more sense, you know, what's yeah, that? we cannot build anything on the market basket site, correct? Or, because it's not available for development is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's not available for, and so that's why it's not a, a building mandate because it's not available right now. 
I think the thing to also keep in mind is there's market forces, right? So the free market has to play out. A developer has to be interested in developing the site. Market Basket itself either has to be uh, interested in redeveloping the site. We have no indication that they would. They typically don't do that. Just as a, you know, if you take a look around the Massachusetts, Market Baskets tend not to be redeveloped with housing. And, or they would have to be willing to sell their site to a developer that was going to build housing. So there needs to be somebody who thinks it's market feasible. I think there's another thing to point out here. We, we, we kind of discussed it a little bit with the density issue, okay? 15 units per acre requirement. You saw a lot of other developments like the Avalon development, the Princeton development, that are higher than 15 units per acre. What does that tell you? What it tells you is typically developers are not able to build market feasible um, developments that are at 15 units per acre or less. They, they build for higher density. So the lower 15 unit per acre threshold requirement is pretty hard to achieve. Meaning, I don't. I think that if any development were to come through on these parcels in the future, it would be through a discretionary process. They'd be asking for a higher density, but it would have to go through a discretionary process. So it wouldn't be by right. Yes. Correct. If they wanted to go above the by right unit uh, uh, density unit count. And to, to make your point, I think. They can build up to 15 units by right. Right, exactly. If they want to come in asking for more. If they say 15 units per acre isn't feasible for me to get a return on my investment in this property, I need 20 units per acre, then they have to go for a special permit to make that happen. Yeah, in the back. I have two questions, and they don't connect with each other necessarily. Sure. Was Royal Crest looked at as one of these property districts? And if it was, why was it ruled out? And the second question is, what really is the bottom line that the MBTA and, and the state of Massachusetts is looking for in creating these districts? If it's just to zone and not to necessarily build, what's their timeline? There, there have to be discussions at the state level on how quickly they want to take these zones and turn them into housing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be pushing this. So one thing to keep in mind, too, and I'll let Andrew take the question about Royal Crest, um, in terms of the state if they were to then say that we need to construct it there, that would also require an act of the legislature because the statute only mandates zoning. So if it turned to construction, which is very, very unlikely at this time, if that were to happen, it would require the legislature to change the statute. No governor can change that at any time. Um, and in terms of actually the goal, I think there are areas across the state that are going to see development as a result of this. I think it's very unlikely that we are going to see the maximum in every community. And so when we say, I'll take North Andover for example, 1,200 units we need to zone for, it's very unlikely we're going to see exactly 1,200. If, if there's construction, we're going to see 1,200 hit. I think what they are hoping to see is that in some communities where this zoning happens, we'll see maybe 50 units go up in one area, and 100 in another, and 25 in another. And so some incremental change in actual development is, from my perspective, the state's goal right now. And it would require the legislature to act to change it to production. Um, and, and in regards to Royal Crest, to answer your question, Kevin, so did we consider it? Yes, insofar as it's a large parcel of land that's, you know, available for redevelopment in theory. Um, but, you know, it was, it was kind of eliminated after some discussion because of sort of the obvious nature of um, the attention paid to that parcel over the last few years and the um, strong opposition the town has to seeing it redeveloped in the way that was proposed a couple of years ago. Not to say that that's what would have happened if we had proposed it under this scheme. Um, but we thought it was fraught with too much sort of acrimony to really put forward. And then, you know, consider the fact that we, you know, we've already had discussions about traffic. One, Route 114 in that particular area has a lot of traffic issues. Uh, we are going to see the Route 114 um, projects to you know rebuild that roadway but still it's you know it's an area that's a that's a pinch point for many so we wanted to take that into consideration it's further away from the highway um and it's not serviced uh, by MEVA at the moment um and it and, oh that's a good point by jane's making to me that's a good reminder it's also very close to, and, uh, and immediately very close to many um abutters and single family home neighborhoods that's also a feature that's not seen um, at Market Basket, I mean, I know there's some single-family homes not far from Market Basket, but it's not as it's not as uh, close of a relationship or as dense of an area um, as uh, Royal Crest. So we decided that was not, um, you know, as advantageous as these two other uh, proposed parcels. 
Yeah, in terms of those abutters, what we were thinking too is when we're looking at height restrictions, I think we gave an example of four stories. Um, you know, thinking about market basket, it's a, it's a large elevation change between market basket and these single family homes. So if there was height gone up there, it wouldn't look as extreme as it does to the Royal Crest neighbors if you put four stories there. And I see a couple of hands. I'm going to start over here and make my way across the room. In the middle. Oh, so I think there's kind of two different ways to look at this, and I see which way this is going. You can zone something that will pass town meeting or has a more likely chance, which is, I think, the hard work that looks like has been done is in that direction, which makes perfect sense. I think it's also, as someone who does believe we actually do have a housing crisis, it's kind of a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think there'll be some cities and towns that take it as an opportunity to find intelligent ways to create more housing. The folks who are working on this know far more about the town politics than I do, and this is probably, these two parcels are probably far more likely to pass than other ones that I think would be better for the town, like increasing the density downtown, which could have some great effects on the overall town if we had more rooftops downtown. I say that at every meeting I go to. Um, my other comment on the overall, um, this whole law, I was really disappointed when they kind of watered down what the smaller communities have to do. Because a community like North Andover that's been proactive in creating a lot of housing in town gets penalized, in effect, if you think building more housing is penalized, because it's a percentage of a higher number of units. A town like Boxford and other small towns has to create a tiny number. And to me, the whole reason this law was actually created was to make those towns that are doing nothing about creating affordable housing do some affordable housing. So I don't know who got spoken to or how or what lobbying happened, but I'm sure something happened that now, you know, Merrimack and Boxford and towns like that aren't creating much housing. So it's unfortunate. Yeah, so I think that, to that point, I, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it can be frustrating when we look across the state about what the other requirements are. And so one of the challenges I think the state had, and again, I wasn't in the room when they wrote the regulations, but um, a lot of those small towns, the initial regulations required them to zone for a minimum of 750 units, I believe. And the state, I think, was going to have on its hand most small towns just weren't going to comply. And then there was going to be a lot of litigation that would have to unfold. So trying to see how to get them in compliance was the strategy. Um, I'll give the microphone to Andrew in a second. I will mention, as I'm sure you may as well, when we think about other areas available, the town's talking about rezoning downtown right now. And so that is potential for town meeting in the future and is in uh, contract with another consultant to rezone downtown to that uh, respect. And we do see in other communities across the region, some folks we're working with, uh, Georgetown, for example, right now, we're looking at specifically only their downtown for something like this. And so that is an opportunity some communities are seizing. As you said, we have to talk about the, the politics versus um, the best practice in some regards, um, where there are competing areas that could make sense. Downtown, we suggested uh, Sutton Street area to the, the planning board. We had a discussion there. And it was you know, kind of back and forth about does it make the most sense um, at the end of Main Street near uh, the intersection with Sutton Street. And so I think there are other opportunities. We'd be more than welcome to hearing folks' thoughts on that. Uh, Andrew, any other? Yeah, I'll just quickly mention, I, I just I appreciate the comment, um, you know, Alex. I, I think it's a uh, point well taken. And, um, you know, uh, we talked to the planning board about downtown. I do think it's a good opportunity to look at that. But I do also appreciate the planning board's um, and some other folks' opinion on uh, and perspective on the on the on the downtown because we'll we'll have opportunities in the future I think to talk about how we can um, address um, downtown and revitalization there. Um, as Ian mentioned, we have another consultant that we engaged on looking at rezoning downtown. We've kind of shelved that for the moment because this is really the priority. You know, um, I think the thing we have to take into consideration is we have till the end of next calendar year to be in compliance. We're a town, so we have to do things uh, through town meeting. And that's kind of a one-shot deal. Um, so we need to put forward our best foot as far as saying, you know, what is a good solution? It may not be the best solution in a, like a planner's mind or a certain person's mind, but it's a good solution and it's one that's palatable enough that could, it can get the pass a town meeting. And I do think, you know, in the case of both of these parcels, I do, I do think that there's value there as far as redevelopment. Um, if it ever does happen, I mean, as as it was mentioned, Osgood, you know, is has been viewed as a forty yard district. You know, that was passed at town meeting a few years ago. So, it's not it's not outside of the imagination to say that we should utilize this opportunity to say again, the people, you know, Osgood Landing is an appropriate place to to look at this. Yeah, and so I would encourage, like I said, tonight a conversation too. If if folks have other areas in mind, say, did you look at this? Is this an option? I, Waltz will happily talk with the town staff if there are other areas that people have in mind after we've had this conversation. You know, let us know, and we'll 
we'll take a look if we haven't considered it and, and, and think about those factors. Yeah. And then I... Um, are you aware of any towns in the region or the Commonwealth that have pushed back with the state mm -hmm. on any aspect of this requirement? Uh, yes, very few. I think right now there's two or three towns out of the 171 that are subject to the law that have not uh, remained in compliance. And so those communities right now are facing lawsuits from some um, independent organizations. In terms of other communities that are thinking about pushing back, I think every community meeting I've gone to, we've had residents say we just shouldn't comply. That's a, a, a sentiment everywhere. We've also had folks say we need to comply um, and this is a priority. Let me maybe better focus the question. Yeah. Do you know, I'm not asking if there's communities that have chosen not to comply. Okay. I'm asking, do you know of any communities that have said, hey, as a community, we have a concern about yes. this aspect and we are, you know, giving feedback and pushing back to ask if you, the state, can change this because of this specific concern. Not that we're not necessarily going to comply, but we think you got this part of it wrong. Yeah. And what are the issues that those few communities have pushed back on? Thank you. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, so, yes. So the first phase of that came in the initial draft of the regulations last January. And so we had a lot of, again, rural and small towns push back against their unit requirement, speaking to their infrastructure concerns in terms of water capacity, they don't have public sewer, what does that look like? And so that was a pretty major concern. And so that is when the state adjusted some of those regulations. Since then, we have still heard specific concerns from some towns about general infrastructure requirements necessary. The thing that the, the state has been reminding folks is that, you know, let's say you have, it's not the case everywhere in North Andover, but in some towns there are, there's no public sewer system. And so let's say you don't, you want to put a development somewhere, it's incumbent on the developer, let's say, to put in a septic system that can comply with what is necessary at the site so the town doesn't have to build any infrastructure upgrades, so to speak. And so we've heard a lot of infrastructure specific concerns. We've also heard general concerns about, you know, they're focusing this law on the MBTA and the MBTA isn't really doing too hot with service right now. And so why is this funneling through here when we want to create transit oriented development, but we don't have trains that are doing great. And so we've heard that specific concern pretty often as well. Um, One of the concerns that I've heard, and I'll just you know raise it here, um, is that, and we've already heard a comment about this, for those communities who are subject to this requirement, who have a demonstrated track record of um, advocating for and successfully producing multifamily housing, not once or twice or last year or the year before, but really a track record over decades of very sizable numbers, there's no consideration in this formula for that. Right. And I think there's a lot of uh, distance here between saying no, don't want to comply versus some form of pushing back to the state which has been done successfully by those other communities you just gave examples of to say you're creating a disincentive here by not having an element of the formula that doesn't necessarily waive the requirement but gives some credit where credit is due for those communities who have made a lot of progress in, in addressing this crisis even before it was popularly known as a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard other communities expressing that type of concern? Uh, yes, yeah, we've heard that from other communities in this region, um, thinking about their requirements because they've been building housing like North Andover. Um, in terms of the requirements themselves, the last time the state made a change was mostly because of the, um, the the initial regulations they considered draft. They consider these final. However, you know there, there are. I mean, if the if the town itself wanted to, you know, tell the state those specific thoughts, it's more than welcome to. And that's something you know we tend to be we help with uh, a liaison effort. So when we hear these comments, this is this is helpful for us because we talk with the state on a regular basis to get their feedback and for us to give them feedback as well. So this is good for us to keep in mind when we have those conversations. Um, and so I think 
that is a frustration and that's real and that's totally valid and that's an ongoing conversation we're having. I'll stop after I make this one comment that I think it's an opportunity for an MDPC as you're listening for this feedback to help frame uh, feedback to the state from your role as regional saying this is a missed opportunity for the state to actually be incentivizing communities over the longer term that when you act in this manner, you will get credit for and not, you know, as was common before, really punished. Yeah. And um, that type of longer range view, it's, it's the furthest thing from a NIMBY comment. Mm -hmm. It's actually a way to incentivize over a broader scale to say, we recognize those communities who took the initiative and you will get credit for that. Yeah. Yeah, ha more than happy to, to talk with them. We talk to them on a regular basis and, and bring that up and get some feedback and thoughts from them and, and bring that concern and, and, and level it with them. I just wanted to add in regards to uh, Peter's overall comment in regards to providing feedback to the state about the regulations. I just want to be very clear about one thing. It might be somewhat cold comfort, but I just want to point this out that we, um, during the initial phases of this draft, um, of the draft regulations coming out, we were originally an MBTA community. Like, a rail community, not adjacent. We were a rail community. On the basis of us being having land within half a mile of a train station, so over across 195 on um, yes. Mass Ave, yep. there is a section of land that is within half a half a mile of Lawrence train station, and so we had a higher unit capacity requirement. We would have been required to build over 1,700 units, or not build, excuse me, zone four, zone four, over 1,700 units. Um, and we would have had to have 50% of our districts within that little slice of area that was identified as being half a mile from the train station. Obviously, that's totally feasible, both the unit capacity requirement and the location requirement. And because of the comments we and other communities made to the state about that sort of situation, now we have a lower unit capacity requirement, closer to 1,200 units. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the flexibility to put it in many different locations, not only in a certain location as it's positioned from the train station. That's great. I've, I've seen a hand over there. So. Yeah. The numbers that you put up, they said they were from 2020. Uh, which numbers are we looking at? Um, when you're looking at the housing, what... Oh, I think you're referencing... What, was the four These numbers? Of, yes. Yes. So yeah. they're not taking into account the housing that we've added since that time. You're right, and that ends up being a good thing for you uh, because they're taking that number and doing 10% of it to get what they want you to yield. And so it's based off of the 2020 census. That's what they grabbed it from, the, the unit numbers. And so if they accounted for the development you've had in the past few years, your number here would be higher in terms of your total units, and your number of units required would be higher. Um, so it's actually a bit of a benefit for the town to have that. You would think that they would take those units off of what we're required. Because we've added them. Right, but because this is not a building mandate, they're not considering things that have been constructed. And so there are, every other community has added housing since 2020. And so they're not tracking year over year the construction because they're just looking at zoning here. That's the approach. And the other question is, we, you talk about infrastructure and mm -hmm. we have water concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so how are we going to handle that? Yeah. And again, I think some of that will come up in the site plan review process if there's a proposal. Um, I know the town has invested a lot of resources in doing water capacity studies and looking at overall, you know, what is the ability for the town to accommodate more development. And so there's been some pretty extensive, I think, research done in that area and studies to show um, what the potential is, what the draw is like from the lake annually um, and, and, and where there could be uh, room, if so, for development. And so if there was a specific development, we would see, again, Probably that comment and those concerns come up in site plan review with the developer. Just, just to, and I'm not looking to get into a debate on water capacity. I'm really not, but I just want to point out, and I also don't want to, you know, rip off old mandates about Royal Crest, but there was obviously a vigorous discussion about Royal Crest and the ability of the town to absorb the development that was being proposed um, and allow for services to uh, remain, um, you know, intact essentially. And the water capacity was adequate to handle the up to over 30, uh, 1,300 units that were proposed at one point in the Royal, Royal Crest project. This is mandating for less than 1,300 units. So. Well, and since Royal Crest clearly wants to be redeveloped, 
why would why wouldn't we use that instead of having I heard your explanation, but now they're still gonna want to be redeveloped and then we're adding two other areas on. So First of all, I, I'm not in their heads, real crust. I don't think uh, any, you know, we can't presuppose that anybody wants to do anything. I know that's a good that's a good assumption based on the fact that they brought forward a proposal a couple of years ago. But who knows? Maybe they thought, hey, we went through that process and we got roundly rejected, and we're not in a position to want to bring uh, back anything anytime soon. Maybe not. Maybe you're right. Maybe they do want to bring something forward. But the. Maybe they want to redevelop, maybe they want to renovate their units. Maybe they want to add a very small number of units or a couple more buildings. I don't know, there could be any number of scenarios. We can't presuppose anything. So because of the other factors identified, the traffic issues, um, the proximity to abutting neighbors, the lack of transit access, and all of the other sort of acrimony involved with uh, propo the proposal that Royal Crest saw a couple years ago, I just, you know, again, we just have to make choices as far as how we want to comply with this. and so. These are the these are the areas that we're identifying as um, as those areas. And if they were to come forward and suggest that they do want to redevelop again, any type of redevelopment would very likely require a zoning amendment, and that zoning amendment would have to independently be brought to town meeting to again be voted on. Yeah. Thank you. Those are great questions. Um, did I see another hand just before that? Yeah. So the question, in your layout of the districts and the plug and play model, yeah. were you anticipating more of that um, moderate, uh, you know, I guess, what do you call it, yeah. moderate density yeah. uh, housing, not necessarily the large, I think everyone here is multifamily, they think yeah. massive four stories, hundreds of units, when in reality it could be done yeah. 20, 30 units at a time. Did the model contemplate for that at all? Because I think it, that becomes a much more palatable Maybe. sell to people when you show the pictures of, you know, Marblehead Street mm -hmm. uh, versus you know, Princeton properties. Yeah, and so the short answer is no. The model doesn't um, consider that. However, when we look at the dimensional requirements and the parcels themselves, we can anticipate what type of development may go in. And so the reality is, and, and Andrew and Gene might be might have different opinions or be upset at me for saying it, but the reality is, in some of these larger parcels, you're probably going to see um, larger developments because they're such large parcels and they could allow for that kind of development. If we took the approach, one of the things we've discussed and that was brought up earlier, let's say you looked at a more dense area of downtown or any other spot, if you had a lot of smaller parcels, that would lend it to that Marblehead Street, those types of units that I showed earlier. The concern is, uh, does that translate uh, for folks when they're thinking about voting on the Suntown meeting? You know, What's the approach in terms of the perspective of putting all this if this housing is zoned downtown, it doesn't make sense and is it politically feasible given that we're going to be doing zoning rechanges in a couple of, in another year or two. And so in terms of those small developments, if we found spaces that made sense for all the factors we chose these other parcels that are made up of smaller parcels, then we could see some smaller development. The reality is in some of the areas we've chosen, we may see that medium to larger scale development just given the structures of the parcels. And uh, Gene, I don't know if you have any other comments on that too. I just have one thing to add. Based on the size of these parcels, and we're potentially going to zone to really hit that minimum number, residential units, but what we think we have opportunity for is mixed-use developments of both these sites in order to make it profitable for the developer. Because we suspect, given that Avalon, the review went on quite a while, negotiated down units to 18 units per acre, you know, we were probably right at the cusp of it being permittable for them. And so at 15 units per acre, if it was a mixed-use development, there's economies of scales there and they potentially can have a profitable development. That being said, we've also talked internally about how do we incentivize it to be mixed-use and not only residential. And as we said earlier, if the minimum is 15, maybe by special permit they can get 20 if they do mixed-use too. And so we're not into the weeds of zoning yet, but these are the kind of conversations we have. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think for the for the politics of it, for the sale of, of yeah. if you're getting this town meeting, um, the optics get a little bit more challenging for people when they think large massing, which, and, and no matter how many times we say zoning, people are going to hear production. Certainly. You say, how many units are coming? People are yeah. going to hear that. So we have to really be like, careful with that message. And I, I would certainly encourage, you know, as we've talked about it and looked at the districts and as, 
you folks may remember, will be brought to select board and planning board. And we talked about some of the Sutton Street intersection areas and some of downtown. There were some smaller parcels included in that that might lend themselves to the smaller type of development. Some of the parcels were in that medium scale for this. And so, you know, that's why we're here today is to see, you know, maybe there is an appetite for it to be in downtown where there's a lot of small, par small parcels and you would see smaller scale development. Um, or maybe the appetite is to keep it in um, the relative outskirts as we've looked at so far. So that's an open conversation. Yeah. Now, I'll just ask a question of Gene or, or Peter. Did the planning board feel that the downtown district was a much harder sell at town meeting? Was that part of the discussions? Um, I'll comment briefly and then ask Gene to please comment. But um, when this presentation was coming to the planning board, it, it was, hey, we want to tell you about the three sites that we've selected. And the result of the planning board was to say, wait a minute. How did you get to three sites? Let's open the aperture. Please come to the planning board with everything in town that could conceivably fit. And um, through the course of that meeting, we ended up with where they were proposing. So yes, the planning board considered a much wider aperture. It did include the downtown. There was a lot of discussion about that. And it revolves around things like the uh, large amount of uh, additional uh, multifamily already relatively recently put here, uh, traffic concerns, and you know, we've done parking studies that the studies indicate that there's a surplus of parking. That's not what the planning board hears from people who live and work in the downtown. So uh, it was just part of the discussion to say, you know, with respect to town meeting, that issue is going to come up again, regardless of what the plan, uh, what the parking studies have told us. So, so sort of a yes to that part of your question. But Gene, can you help with this, please? So I just, I just want to speak to that presentation. In my opinion, we didn't have to say these are the three we selected. We narrowed it down. These are three potential sites. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the Sutton Street. You know, we presented as a potential improvement to a gateway entrance to North Andover. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity, and the parcels vary in size significantly. I think the board was receptive to looking at it and to certainly considering rezoning to create that type of experience, but they wanted to do it more organically. They wanted to, to do it through zoning, maybe still require a special permit, but put parameters in place that may allow us to transition to that. It wasn't a hard no, we don't want to consider Sutton Street. It's just not under this parameter. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Um, and I would certainly say, and I would hope that um, folks get the impression that this is an ongoing open conversation. And so, you know, when we talk to the planning board and select board, I, I would hope it doesn't feel like we're telling you these are the options you have to go with. Um, throughout this entire process, we're trying our best to, to say that these are options. And it may end up that this is what we go with exactly as we just said today. It may very well be that it, a lot changes between now and town meeting 2024. So we want continual feedback and, and we want to hear from you all. Um, this has been very informative for us. I hope it's been very informative for all of you. Um, feel free to take um, those fact sheets with you. Um, as always, I'm sure the town's open to hearing more from you all and reaching out and chatting about your ideas. We're going to have some more engagement conversations um, throughout the rest of this process. Um, and I think Jean just wanted to comment on some of that as well. I just want to add one comment. So you did suggest that we put this on the website, and we will. We'll also provide the video links to the presentations we did, both to the joint meeting with the planning board and select board, as well as that follow-up meeting Peter referred to, where we took kind of a deeper dive, more um, town-wide centric, and we'll put that link up as well. Okay, so it will be on the building section, or under community, under community, community and economic development. Okay. And we'll, we'll, we'll issue an email too. They'll send an email as well, is what Andrew's saying. Yes, great. All right, well, thank you again so much, all, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate your time. And as always, feel free to reach out with uh, questions and comments. Have a good night.